Well, welcome everyone to the Dr. Hedberg Show. This is Dr. Hedberg, and I'm very excited today to have Nikki Graytrix on the show. I heard her on the 15-Minute Matrix with Andrea Nakayama, and uh, just really enjoyed that that interview, so I wanted to have her on today. So Nikki, is she's actually uh, an award-winning nutritional therapist, bioenergetic practitioner, and transformational coach. She helps people to optimize energy. And in 2005, she co-founded one of the largest mind-body clinics in integrative medicine in the UK. The results with patients at the clinic were published as a preliminary study in 2012 in the British Medical Journal Open. In August 2015, she hosted the largest ever online health summit on overcoming fatigue, interviewing 29 world-leading experts on optimizing energy with over 30,000 attendees. So, Nikki, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's awesome to be here. Great. So, a lot of my listeners are familiar with the material I've been putting out on adverse childhood experiences, but why don't we just lay some bedrock for that. Can you give us just an overview of, of what adverse childhood experiences are? Yes. So um, it's very interesting. It's based on a lot of data that's been done, actually. It's been a lot of mainstream research that should get more attention, in my view. So um, there were some big studies done by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente uh, looking at what they were calling adverse childhood events, and they called them ACEs. And uh, they were looking at if you had a high level of ACEs, uh, the sort of correlation with illness in adulthood. But the sort of things they were looking at were um, sort of parents separating and divorce, that would count as, a, as an ACE. Um, things like physical, sexual or emotional abuse, um, physical or emotional neglect, domestic violence, mental illness in the family, substance abuse, um, or things like incarceration of a family member. So that those were the particular categories that were chosen by the researchers that were working, it's about the mid 1990s they started that work. And it's important work because it, it really, the, the I'm sure you've covered some of the data, it never does any harm just to mention, you know, if you had a high level of ACEs, you have an increased risk of seven out of the top 10 causes of death, 67% of all the people in these studies, and, and there were, it was a huge study, there were like, it was almost 17,500 people in the study, 67% had said, look, we, we had exposure to some degree of this, and that, that was probably an underestimate, which we can talk more about why that is. Mm -hmm. um, I got into this topic because things like chronic fatigue, you have a six-fold increased risk of chronic fatigue in adulthood if you had ACEs in childhood, so I call fatigue and the kind of fibromyalgia and those kind of related illnesses. I like the poster children for adversity in childhood. Um, you know, and if you if you had six ACEs, you have a 20-year reduction in lifespan. So hopefully that gives people a bit of an idea about why we're talking about it and the types of things we're talking about. Yeah, it's a big issue. And in my 15 years of, of functional medicine practice, I do admit that it's something that I overlooked, you know, early on for many years. Just no one was really familiar with it or, or talking about it. So one, one thing I wanted to ask, um, you had mentioned, so one of the questions on the ACE questionnaire, I'm, I'm having difficulty getting a good answer on this, so maybe you know, but how come, uh, how come an ACE is if your parents get a divorce, but death of a parent is not considered an ACE or is it? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So this is an area where the researchers, you know, they really, um, they didn't come up with an exhaustive li list. They, they weren't expecting the results that they got and they really just chose 10 categories a bit arbitrarily to, um, kind of, you know, start that they had data already on those areas. And so they just picked 10 areas and they held their hands up afterwards and said, listen, we missed a lot of different aces. And it's, it's why I said there was also an underestimate in that 67%. So they missed out like being a victim of bullying, for example. Um, and definitely death of a parent, it would count for sure. So um, yeah, there were lots of things. And you know, they didn't mention, this is a whole topic we could touch on, but um, intergenerationally inherited trauma 
trauma. So um, when they were asking people, you know, did you have any ACEs? You might say no in your childhood, not realizing you've actually inherited the psychological and physiological expression of trauma because your parent or grandparent actually experienced the trauma. And we know that because of the survivors of the Holocaust victims. And there's been a lot of research done in around the world where there's been famine or, or, or genocide and so on, the third generation survivors of their grandparents who were in the trauma have the same physiological and psychological expression. So that's another area that uh, people can underestimate as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a big area. Yeah, so I've, I just count that. I've been counting that as an ace if, um, if they had a death of a parent. Um, because to me, I mean, at least from my understanding that when your parents divorce, that's obviously very traumatic, but I would, I think death is, um, would supersede that. So what about the, so let's say someone knows they have at least a, an A score of one or higher. How do these ACEs actually affect health? Yes. What are the mechanisms? So again, they did research looking at the impact of early life stress on the biology. And they started with actually looking at rats and things like this. And and they they literally found that there's, there's a neuroendocrine immune system reset. There's a shift that happens in the epigenetic expression of your sensitivity to stressful events that happen really from the date that the trauma started. And remember, well, t- we need to talk more, more about this, but we are not talking about necessarily at all a one-off event. We're talk- that can definitely be a one-off event can definitely cause that neuroendocrine immune system reset. It's also more of the chronic, just lack of emotional connection will create biological changes in the baby. So uh, we have these things called mirror neurons where a baby will actually learn to feel empathy because mum can feel empathy. So the baby actually develops these mirror neurons. So she or he is reflecting what's being expressed to the baby from the mother. Um, so, and this, so mirror, mirror neurons, another fascinating a- area of how, again, social relations, OP, other people, how they affect us. And the brain does not develop in isolation. It develops in response to our social interactions, our social environment. And the interesting thing is about trauma is most trauma is relational. It comes from other people. It, the, the very rare form of trauma is what we always kind of assume when we say the word trauma, people think of maybe a car accident or a natural disaster, or maybe hospitalization as a young child for some kind of procedure. Now, definitely those things are are traumatic. They're just relatively rare. Most trauma comes from a child's attachment relations. Usually that's the parents uh, or it's key caregivers or authority figures and so on. So in response to what's happening in this social interaction, it's not only this, this biochemical change, usually it, it essentially is upregulating the stress response si- system. And we, we kind of, most people know that, that stress is bad for you, that stress kills, but really the ACEs study shows that, you know, the developing brain is particularly vulnerable. The developing brain is below age 18. So the brain is still highly imprintable. Um, it's still, the neurons are literally there to respond to external stimuli. So an event that could happen as an adult will just become a state. It might lead to PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a stress response to that specific event or anything that triggers or reminds you of that event. The issue with a developing brain is that the state's really that should stay as states become traits they become part of the personality type so we've got this multifactorial impact we've got this neuroendocrine immune system reset where our system is in a state of stress it's reset from the date the trauma starts to happen 
we ch our biology and, and, and neurology changes as well. And also very importantly, we don't want to forget this, that the identity of the child changes. So this is where we call uh, like sort of survival adaption mechanisms kick in. So when a child, for example, doesn't get emotional bonding from the parents, and by the way, the statistics on that are incredible. It's, it, I think it's only 55% of babies securely attached with mother. So this was done with, in the strange situation studies. 6,000 mother-baby interactions were observed and only about a quarter, 55% will securely attach. The other sort of 45% are split between insecure attachment, which is where there's a lot of anxiety from the baby and they find it very hard to, to calm themselves. So they lose the ability to self-soothe. And the other group is they actually shut down from the emotional connection. Like mum leaves the room, the baby doesn't really care. Mum comes back in the room, baby doesn't respond. And that's, that's more reflective of, of being rejected by the mother, which is very sad. So um, th these kind of attachment issues, um, it causes not only social interaction problems, but it causes a sense of isolation and alienation in the child that they're not building up a sense of ability to self-soothe and safety. The, the, the expression of the glucocorticoid res, uh, re, um, receptors reflect that. Really the key thing is, you know, the body and the mind are one thing. So what's going on socially is just mirrored by the biology, um, which is why it starts to, you know, I, I say it's, it, with a developing brain, like states become traits, which become your biological fate. That's really what we're talking about with what we call relational developmental trauma. And that's not the same as PTSD. And it's the other reason why that ACEs study was uh, really an underestimate because it's very hard let's say there was emotional neglect that happened so in other words that's not what happened in childhood it's what didn't happen it's the connections that weren't there it's the encouragement the seeing of the child making them feel loved seen encouraged and understood even that is traumatic for the child and there are there are thousands of people out there who don't realize they've experienced emotional neglect for example they know something's wrong but it's very hard on a very superficial ACEs study that was those questions in the ACEs study. Look, it was a great study and it was an amazing study. It was a landmark study, but it was really too fish, uh, superficial to elicit relational trauma because how can a child below, you know, below age, age 10 self report in adulthood that they had emotional neglect. And I would, I would, to say this I, I believe we are in an epidemic of emotional dumbness we live in an emotional sort of a dumb society we, we're not emotionally intelligent we don't know what to do with emotions even if we know what we're feeling we don't know how to respond to them um, actually i would say that is much more prevalent epidemic and damaging to health than the standard american diet it's that pr uh, prolific mm -hmm. and it, it's that much of an area that we need to bring attention to and that's why i'm, I'm trying to get the word out as as best as i can because you know one of the you brought up some really interesting points and some things that that I just want to um, to buttress with what you were talking about. And the first is, you know, you help differentiate these single traumas, you know, like a rape or a car accident from the ongoing trauma of, you know, a parent who is disconnected from their kid. And I think the difficult part for a lot of people is that you just sort of become accustomed to yourself and who you are and you just, you're unaware of how these childhood experiences have changed you. And as an adult, it's just very hard to notice these subtle undertones of who you are and, and why you act the way you do and why you respond to other people and stress the way you do. You just think that that's, who you are and then you just sort of think that that's how other people are as well so how do you tap into that into the people who are skeptical or who are just they just they're dissociated from their own emotions and how they feel about themselves yeah that's it's a really important point 
So it's, it's a really, it's a journey of awakening. It really is. Um, it, it often will start, it starts, there has to be a cognitive sort of, you know, start to read and learn and do things like listen to podcasts like this. And then some of the deeper work starts. I, I happen to work with the Enneagram, which is a personality typing system. And it's one of the few which really gets to childhood experience and assesses that and kind of demonstrates how see what happens is when we've had these sort of neglectful experiences we re don't realize like you say we've, we're actually in a survival pattern and we don't know anything else we don't know any other way we just that's the way it went mm -hmm. so one of the things that i encourage people to do is to start uh, there's a brilliant book about emotional neglect by dr john east webb called running on empty and this is a that's a good place to start for emotional neglect where she'll go through and, and, and as soon as you start reading the stories and something things are going to start resonating with you, you go oh my goodness that's exactly what my family upbringing was like that's how i felt oh my goodness i didn't realize that's a pattern i'm running and then you start to build the awareness. The Enneagram is another way of doing that. So I, I won't go into detail, but you can tell just by the names. I'll just share some of the types. There's nine different personality types in the Enneagram. There's the, there's the Achiever, type three. There's the Giver, which is the type two. There's the type one perfectionist. Um, and the, what, I talk about four of them a lot because they're most pressed to, uh, they're most likely to get stress related conditions. Mm -hmm. type, type six is the loyalist, also known as the anxiety type. So if you just think about the, the titles of those, these are adaption strategies of when we didn't get love, essentially, when we don't get this unconditional expression that, that we get those mirror neurons going on, that, that basically we know that we're just basically okay most of us don't get that message and then we're in doing something to have to earn that so we could become super achievers we become over givers to others because that's how we've learned to get love we thought we had to give it away or we think we have to do everything perfectly and then we'll get love or we'll worry about everything mm -hmm. and think there's no support in the world there's nobody there to support us so it's this, it's this process of, of becoming, first of all, aware about, you can look at external behaviors. Often it starts there. And frankly, as so many of my clients in the, in the kind of fatigue burnout side of things, it's not just that, it's the female dominant illnesses like autoimmunity as well, where you'll start, you, you start putting the mirror up and showing people, even in behavioral ways, uh, where they're not doing self-care. Like, or it, under, underneath all that, there's an addiction to things like overworking, overgiving. And, it's, and if somebody's got health condition, that should be a red flag for, mm, you might want to look into, ha have I got certain adaption styles that have actually come from the fact that, you know, I had, there was some deficiencies in childhood. It's not our parents' fault. Our parents did the best that they could and they had parents who were like them. You know, that's how they learned to do it. So it's, that's why I was mentioning about the intergenerational aspect. Mm -hmm. so, um, so it is this process of awareness. And you mentioned about disassociation. You know, things like, that's very important. The specific things you can do just to get more connected to your emotions. Um, so for some people who've actually disassociated into the mind, that's very, very common, where we go into the mind and the intellect and it's the way out. It was our escape mechanism. A lot of us do that because these were painful. This like, coming into the world and feeling like you didn't belong, having feelings of shame or isolation or alienation, which is really, I call that self-love deficit it's feelings of unworthiness that really is at the core of whatever type of trauma happened there's that piece there and um, it's epidemic levels and we know that from huge studies in loneliness for example that that is also is shortening our lifespan from a physio physiological perspective as well mm -hmm. so starting to become aware of that of feelings and become connected to emotions uh, a lot of it is is a, a yoga practice is really important to connect to ground into the physical body to start feeling again if you're somebody who's very intellectual breathing exercises are very important also mindful exercise mindfulness exercises so that you just start to check in more through the day and ask yourself how are you feeling uh, in this moment um, and you might notice how many times have you asked that in childhood how many times did an adult ask you not what are you doing if you've done this mm -hmm. go and don't do this get that done how are you feeling you know so you have this is part of the process of reparenting so you, you need to take on that role and there's no 
one size fits all approach. So there's some people, if they're very in their head and very anxious, I actually won't tell them to do things like meditation because they'll probably just feel worse and it all, they, they won't be able to do it. They might be better suited to doing body work like, like yoga. And that can be massively transformative for them. So it, everybody's different. That's very important as well. It's like functional medicine. It needs to be personalized. Mm -hmm. I like that. So Running on Empty is uh, one of the books that you recommend. And I also like Childhood Disrupted. That's another excellent one on, on the ACEs. Now, yes. have, you, have you seen any, I mean, I know there's a lot on gender differences, um, but could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Are you seeing uh, yes. more women with more issues or are men just being overlooked? How do you see that? So this is Dr. Bruce Perry's work. He's done some work on this. He's a, a psychiatrist and also a researcher. And it's, it's him that actually talked about like traits become, um, states become traits and so on. And it's definitely the case that boys and girls respond to emotional neglect and, and ACEs differently. So if you're the less, basically, if you're a female, you're much more likely to, to get dissociative disorders and you basically discount your needs and you just kind of, the best way of dealing with it is like not to have needs at all. So the child just disconnects from their own needs because nobody else has recognized them. So they get suppressed with boys. They're much more likely to do, to be much more overt and it's things like ADD, ADHD, um, you know, oppositional defiant behaviors, they externalize more. So boys and girls definitely respond to the same trauma, things like emotional neglect, this, uh, differently. It's actually probably, it, might, it seems possibly more related also to the, the balance of power. So if the abuse, if, if there's an overt abuser happening, it, the person in the, the authority, it tends to be more overt in their response back if they're being traumatized. If you have less control and power, you tend to be more likely to disassociate. You can't fight back. You're going you're gonna to hit back on some, you know, mm -hmm. if, so you would tend to disassociate and that's how you cope with it. Um, so that's very interesting. Um, it, it's, an, it's a kind of important factor. So it's often... They're also, you know, there's the other side of this is that some people will respond to emotional neglect more with the sort of narcissistic sociopathic response. Um, and then they become abusers in adulthood and they do that to others. Mm -hmm. So uh, it tends to be that masculine will tend to be a bit more on the, the narcissistic sociopathic response and females will tend to be more stress related disorders, autoimmunity, fibromyalgia, that whole side of things. It's interesting. I suspect that that men who are more on the sociopathic, narcissistic side, and women can totally be that way too. I should just say, mm -hmm. um, they're sort of less stressed. They have less anxiety because they're disconnected from feelings. But they're the type that's more likely to drop dead from a heart attack. I hate, I hate to say it. So it's it. There is some definite differences in how people respond and the type of illnesses they get as well. Yeah, and I can't let this conversation go without just asking you about social media and if there's any interplay there because obviously a lot of young people now a lot of their connection with other people is through social media i know that has some some differences in in gender how it affects boys and girls do you see social media compounding the problem in any way or how do you look at that whole yeah I, yeah Absolutely. It's, it's like the word compounding. That is what it's doing. And the studies are already coming out showing um, at high levels of social media use. It, also things like violent video games, all this, the, the media in general, when it's negative, um, is, it, it reduces people's heart rate variability. So it's, it's, it's creating stress and it increases feelings of loneliness. And the studies are coming through for that already so um yeah it's, it's a real compounding factor so yeah it's actually one of my top tips is to to minimize the like media use in general so not only social media but just screen time as well mm -hmm. so the like you know being aware about you know are you connecting with yourself never mind with other people so um yeah it's another major factor we we live in a society that's almost designed to uh, not support self-love and not support us feeling okay about ourselves and feeling connected to ourselves. And that we, 
part of this sort of the, the trauma, this disconnect we feel when we have these feelings of shame, alienation, social isolation, that those are obviously their painful feelings. And what most people do, depending on the degree of how bad that feeling is, that is the source of the majority of addiction, whether that's drugs, uh, alcohol abuse, the, the ACEs, if you have four ACEs, you have a, you're 11 times more likely to use injection drugs. Um, you're more than seven times as likely to be a binge drinker. Sorry, three times as likely to be a binge drinker, more than seven times as likely to be an alcoholic, more than three times as likely to engage in risky sexual behavior. And all of that is, it's distracting. It, it, it's anything to take away feeling the, the gut wrench that they're actually, a person's feeling inside. So those are all distractions and we're all doing things to distract us from uncomfortable feelings because we don't know how to deal with emotions or how to open up to ourselves that's what isn't taught in the school so we'll go off and we'll become workaholics we never spend time connected to ourselves we'll focus on helping everybody else instead um, we'll do it with food we'll do it with alcohol whatever it is that's taking away the pain so um yeah that was an important point to make as well because ace is probably the number one cause of all addiction as well mm-hmm just talking to you about this, I, I'm just thinking about if there are any potential cultural differences, anything that you've read or, or come across in that, I'm just thinking of certain cultures, areas of the world where there's still large communities of people living together very closely compared to cultures where, say in the West, where people are very isolated, a lot of single parenting and things like that. Do you have anything to add to that question about culture? Yes. Um, I de it was definitely, it was a factor, uh, remember, in some of this research about what they're calling the blue zones. So the areas where people are living the longest and there's, uh, there's longevity and they've researched certain communities. I think one of the areas is in parts of Italy, parts of Japan. Uh, there are actually pockets all over the world where there's a lot of... Um, they're called centenarians, right? They're people mm -hmm. who live over a hundred years old. And there were certain factors they would find commonly in that group. And it wasn't these strict dietary things that we often think like that person, that those people mustn't be eating gluten or they must never drink. No, that's, they would have alcohol. They would drink, be wine drinkers that, but one of the, the, factors which would show up every time was a strong sense of community um, a lot of socializing and a family connection for sure they also throw into that uh, meaning and purpose very important factors as well these are probably the some of the biggest factors for health the, you know everybody thinks it's diet it's how much you exercise whether you smoke whether you drink i would say it's probably uh, how well socially connected you are to others and if you if you're if you feel social connection good with others you usually feel good with yourself as well it's not really possible if you don't feel at home in yourself mm -hmm. to, to have that with another person so yeah so that that's very interesting so some of that data kind of bears it out and of course we're, we're kind of seeing you know this is sort of attack on the family family values that are all kind of being so unfortunate that that is is on its way down it seems at the moment we seem to have a, an attack on certain family values happening right now and yes it's only gonna it's only gonna make the socialization you know these aspects worse and it's gonna it's not only gonna affect people in terms of happiness and feelings of well-being it's also going to affect the health. And those two things go together. It's why Professor Bessel van der Kolk, he's the world leading expert on trauma, his book, which I also recommend, is called The Body Keeps the Score. Mm -hmm. But the body keeps the score. He's basically saying the mind and the body are one thing. And you might not remember that you had a trauma in childhood. You may not realize that you had you know, emotional neglect, but your body does. Your body remembers everything. It's mapped it, it's right there, and it's biologically changed in response to that trauma. And it's why you might have health issues in adulthood that may have been a trigger, but ultimately you could probably trace that to 20 years ago when the neuroendocrine immune system reset and the stress response changed. So mm -hmm. that's another very good book that I also do recommend. Yeah, the body keeps the score. I've got it on my my shelf. I haven't gotten to it yet, but I've I've heard a lot of great things about it. And you mentioned, I'm glad you mentioned the the mind body uh, thing there again. I actually don't really like that term. I know a lot of people that don't like it because when you say mind body, it's almost like saying that they're separate. And you, as you said, they're not separate at all. And then when you talk to people about these things, 
you know, some people think you're telling them that it's all in their head. Yeah. And we just, we have to really drill this home that there is no separation. Everything that you think and you believe and everything that you went through, like you said, it's going to affect everything. I mean, the other thing that I like that you, I'm glad you said was related to diet because there's so much focus on that. But, you know, I had, I had this patient years ago, he had inflammatory bowel disease and he could hardly eat anything. But when he went to his grandmother's house, who he was very close to growing up, you know, very, very deep connection, probably deeper than his, his own parents, um, he could eat her cooking and it was gluten and sugar and dairy, you know, it was just all Southern home cooking, all the things that are considered today highly pro-inflammatory that would set that off. But he could go to his grandmother's house and be with her and he could eat that food and have absolutely no issues at all and then be in his own environment and be eating organic, you know, vegetables and wild caught salmon, like, you know, all these so-called health foods and have major reactions. So there's, there's such a strong connection there. And I think that, that people need to be more aware of these things and how they are affecting their diet and the supplements they take and things like that. Absolutely. And it's, it's really the messages for people to, to, we really need to redefine what we mean by holistic health, like holistic medicine. Um, Cause it's, it's kind of moved from conventional, like where we just use drugs to suppress symptoms, right? The functional medicine movement is fantastic. It kind of, you know, went into systems biology and we kind of got, Oh, everything, you know, we might have our hair falling out, but that could be a gut issue that's affecting thyroid. So it's kind of this connecting the dots that, there's this systems approach, but it's still very sort of biochemical biology focused still. Um, but to really, what I encourage people to do is that if you have a, a chronic something happening with your health, to, to, to use the symptoms, to see them as messengers, to see them perhaps as a call to transformation and to, to consider the journey to health isn't just a physical journey, it's equally an emotional journey. Um, so your journey to, if you, nothing's more important than feeling good. You know, it, it's, if you're, you also want to look at that, how happy and satisfied are you in your life in general? So that's part of the prescription for health. So it's not only what are you, what's, how's your diet? What's your lifestyle? What time are you going to bed? What has your circadian rhythm? Are you getting time in nature? Are you, you know, getting time in, in the sunlight? Um, have you cut out the processed food? It, it, those things matter. They're important, but you also do want to look at how, how happy I, am I with myself? How happy am I in my relationships? Am I living my heart's desire? How close to am I, am I on purpose? Do I have supportive, healthy relations around me? And that's just as important. Um, and this whole, this whole sort of body, mind, mind, body thing, which is one thing, um, there's, there's multiple ways those two things are interrelated. It's not only, you know, emotions are biochemical there. We feel differently because of hormones, but it's also neurological and it's also energetic emotions and thoughts aren't nothing. There's, they are, they're also energetic. So it's important to kind of be multifactorial in your approach. So you consider actually it's for the, in the ideal world, you take this kind of change the biochemistry, change the neurology and change the energetic side as well, which, you know, things like the emotional freedom technique, um, it's interesting that the frontline treatments, even for PTSD, are energetic interventions um, like EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. You know, we're actually getting into Chinese medicine here. It's it's part of based on the meridian system. So it's very interesting that all that's coming through as well. And and then we have this whole, the whole quantum physics side of this. I do touch on this as well. This mind body thing. Not only look, the ACES studies shows unequivocally you can't not consider you know the psychology, but this quantum physics has also proven that you know our intentions impact matter and your intentions to heal your visualization your positive mindset positive optimistic expectations that counts too. look at the placebo effect but it's a gigantic area that area we could have got into that's you know the most one of the most science-backed areas you know in science because every randomized control trial has a placebo right so 
um, yeah, so it's, it's important. It's just, it's a really big factor when you sort of consider if you've got a health issue, be holistic, meaning consider all of that. And usually people, they touch on enough areas that eventually you'll start to get that tipping point and you'll start to get improvement over time when you take this multifactorial approach. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so as far as, so somebody knows that, that they have a, an ACE of one or higher and, and childhood trauma, you've already mentioned a number of things for how to heal EMDR. I also like somatic experiencing and neurofeedback, you know, can also be helpful. There's some, there's a lot of different modalities out there that people can reach for. Is there, is there anything else that uh, you can think of that we haven't mentioned that people, sh people should be thinking about if they want to try and heal? Yeah. So the first, the first thing I would just say, if there's a difference between relational trauma and PTSD, as we mentioned, PTSD is usually in response to a single event. Like you mentioned, it could have been a car accident, could have been an assault, could have been something that generally is a discrete event. That is, I actually interviewed Professor Bessel van der and he's like, yeah, PTSD is pretty curable these days. And he's, he's right. Uh, and the frontline treatments are things like EMDR and it's, it's a conventional intervention. It's the people are well trained in it because it's, it's within the conventional area. So if you have a PTSD type issue, uh, go for EMDR, go for, go for it. There are even you know, other therapies within the conventional realm that work. Somatic experiencing um, and Dr. Peter Levine's work is very good for PTSD as well, that type of trauma. Um, relational trauma is different. And it, it, you might have, usually people d will develop a little bit of t PTSD symptoms to certain discrete events. It doesn't have to be life-threatening because that's the other thing is, you know, people are, some people are more sensitive to all biological context than others. So what traumatizes one person won't necessarily traumatize another. So that's very important. The work of uh, Dr. Elaine Aaron was very interesting, the highly sensitive type. She's the, she's the one who discovered there are highly sensitive people. And then that got completely backed up by mainstream research as well. Though, you know, you could be part of the 20% that are more sensitive to all biological context, which means other people and chemicals and food and all of that. Um, so now the whole topic to talk about is genetically, there is some proof there. Um, so basically, uh, it's helpful to identify you can go to Elaine Aaron's website and actually check in. Are you a highly sensitive person? It's knowing yourself and knowing what your needs are. And with relational trauma, um, yeah, self-identification, what things like looking into the Enneagram, there's a really good book called the wisdom of the Enneagram by Don Reiser and Russ Hudson, Th that type of work for re re relational trauma. It's going to be a mixture of doing some things that are more for PTSD because a lot of people have a little bit of that going on and they have like the relational trauma symptoms, relational trauma symptoms are more to do with like shame, this feeling of um, alienation, trouble in like attracting people in relation that tend to be selfish or that we seem to be giving ourselves away all the time we never have time for ourselves that's more of the relational trauma that's some re this reparenting really needed with that and it's it's more of a daily practice and i would say probably the, the one of the, the things i would give to people as the takeaway it the, the thing that will have really get to the core of transforming relational trauma and it takes time to do it it really is compassion and it's self acceptance radical self acceptance starting to recognize that oh yes i have these traits or yeah i have i have this low self esteem i have this big inner judge and starting to accept that that's okay and still having a thousand percent compassion for yourself with all the stuff the person you've become it starts with acceptance um, this, uh, this, this is the start of self-love because what happens is you, as you become more aware and you start doing this research, then you can start saying, oh my God, I'm really judgmental of myself. And you start to notice that. And then you get judgmental about the fact that you see yourself being judgmental. <laughs> so mm -hmm. there's like a spiral that starts. So somewhere you've got to break that. And, you know, um, things like EFT, the emotional freedom technique, that's a very useful tool because it's all about you accept everything. Even though I have this judgment in a judge, I deeply and completely accept myself. Like, and you literally, I have people do what, like a process where they look at everything that they're like, every time they're catching themselves, 
negating themselves, discounting themselves, judging how they look, how they feel, how they're aging, whether they're too fat, too thin, not funny enough, not intellectual enough. It's, the list goes on and on and on. It's catching all of that and saying, no, I'm, I am 1000% supportive of myself. I, I'm 100% supportive of myself. Um, and it's starting with affirmation, that, that kind of daily practice. Um, and I, I, morning times are really important, like just doing gratitude journaling is also fantastic. Appreciation work, meditation work, these all raise your heart rate variability that make you feel better. Um, and uplifting material, staying away from the negative, violent stuff, the news. And, you know, in the morning time, having a little routine where you've got some affirmations that really resonate with you. You know, just do two or three things when you get up in the morning. It might be listening to something um, uplifting, maybe some meditation music, maybe three things you feel grateful for. Write some affirmations that you feel that that um, are positive for you. Just three or four things, and do that every day. It'd be life changing. It'd be absolutely life changing with people. But it's this daily reparenting in those ways, and the rest of it is just it's awareness work, becoming more aware about the ways that we don't appreciate ourselves, or the ways that we discount our needs, or the way that we kind of are not supporting ourselves. And it is a process of awakening because you'll start to do some of this, and you'll realise how much you don't take care of yourself, and that's a whole thing in itself to then come to terms with and go oh okay so but constant compassion is a huge part of it um so the reparenting process the acknowledgement and the acceptance on a daily basis is really it's what heals relational trauma and self-love deficit at the end but it, it does it's a process mm -hmm. i hope those that's all, helpful <laughs> yeah those are all excellent i i do recommend a number of those to patients the journaling gratitude uh, meditation and things like that. So now I've been following uh, the recent uh, psychedelic research that, that has come out. I know there's some work there on PTSD and addiction and things like that. Have you seen anything in, in your reading on psychedelics and what we're talking about? Yeah, I think that is a, a, the other gigantic kind of growth area. It's probably at the leading edge of research and trauma, mm -hmm. both PTSD and relational type trauma, developmental trauma. So they're already they're already pretty. They're getting the data through saying it, it can pretty much heal PTSD. I was actually it was again Professor Bessel van der Kolk that I interviewed, and he said, "Yeah, we're looking at." He was looking at ecstasy, like M MMDA. Um, mm -hmm. To, for that and he was saying yes we're definitely getting results with PTSD with the relational trauma he said there's a question mark right now I do think that it, it's I think these experiences like having a journey experience whether that's with mushrooms um, or you know and ayahuasca is becoming more and more sort of well known now not obviously legal here in the US but there are places right. that you can go abroad um, it definitely, it will, it will, actually there's a, I should say there's a TED talk online. It was actually by a, a, a neuroscientist and it's called My Stroke of Insight. It's a 20 minute TED talk. She's a neuroscientist and she literally, she has a stroke and she's describing what's happening. She had a stroke and she describes what happens. You can get a feel from what she says that was like of what these kind of journeys, what can happen because what it does is it, it takes out the analytical brain and all the resistance that we hold. And once you take that away, that's what psychedelics do. And this, I recommend just listening to that 20 minute TED, TED talk. It's extremely moving. And it's the sort of things that you can experience. It's, it's getting that experience that you never experienced in childhood. You can access states of love that you may never have been exposed to before. So in that sense, you'll get a reference point. Now that can be life changing. Just having a journey and like where you just, you know, one evening you do this, do a journey with sort of psychedelics and you'll have maybe a new reference point of, of a feeling experience that you never had before. So mm -hmm. that can be completely healing for some conditions. Um, for relational trauma, it, the thing is that it, you, it's kind of you experience it once and you'll go back to your old patterns. <laughs> so it's yeah. it, there's still this daily, what I'm finding is there's, you might get some extraordinary information that you learn 
and access to new states that you never thought were possible. So it can be extremely useful. Now you've got, you know, you know, there's a path, you know, the direction you're at least meant to be going in, whereas before it was like completely lost. So I think those kind of experiences are, are very powerful, can be very healing. There's still a lot more research to be done on those, but they're, they're looking very promising. So I do include that, I, you know, within getting it in the safe and legal way. Um, yes, it's a, it's a cutting edge of research, but there's still a one-off trip is kind of, it's not, you'll, you'll need to still have these daily practices. And it's why I talked about, it's a lifestyle thing. It's not something you just do once. If someone said to you like, how often, how, how often, how long should I eat vegetables for <laughs> to be healthy? Um, right. For the rest of your life. So that's really what the de- relational like staying in these uh, well-being states, it's a daily practice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and just so our listeners know, if there is anyone who isn't up on on psychedelics, I just want to let everyone know that there is research being done on those in places like Johns Hopkins and NYU and UCLA. So this is just not some. This isn't some fringe area of science. It's being done at well-respected. Uh, scientific institutions. Now, why don't we close by talking about resiliency? This is something that a lot of people take the ACE test and then they're like, oh, okay, so I've got this score and they think that they're screwed. And then, and then they don't do the resiliency questionnaire to look at that because someone can have a high ACE score, but also be very resilient uh, genetically and, and for other reasons. So can you talk about resiliency and give people some hope to close out the conversation yes so as you say that there is um there is a genetic aspect to this so um and it's very this is yeah this is okay i'll leave you with something very uplifting so what they found i mentioned there's this 20 percent or so that are, are more the highly sensitive types that are more impacted by all biological context and what the researchers are calling children who are the highly sensitives they're calling them orchids and they're saying that the most kids the 80 percent who are a little bit more resilient they're calling them dandelions so it's actually in the research so the dandelion kids you know you can pretty much throw the seeds of dandelions anywhere you know in very sparse uncaring environments and they'll pretty much thrive anywhere with orchids if they don't get greenhouse care they will feel the impact of that much more and it will they're much more likely to have disassociative disorders or to go and develop adhd you know depending if it's a male or female um now the amazing thing about orchids is they actually and people will know as i'm talking about this they know that they have the gift of sensitivity and it is a gift because when children who are orchids get greenhouse care they outperform the dandelions and become some of the most successful people in society. So, and this was empirically proven with uh, hundreds of families that were observed where they, they managed to, like, they picked out the kind of the kids that were having trouble with, with difficult children. They, they, they gave them the greenhouse care and then they compared who had the gene alleles for dandelions and who had the, the gene alleles for the orchids and the orchids blew past their dandelion counterparts when they got extra care um so it was empirically this is in the de- science data um it was proven so mm. if you it, this is why it's important to understand your own make and model are you more of an orchid type so it means that there's it's just you're knowing that stuff is a good thing because it means you can optimize your environment to meet your genetic potential it's not something a scary thing it's an it's an opportunity to know that i am a highly sensitive type i have this special gift highly sensitive types tend to be much more aware about their environment they have empathic gifts with others um they they more they notice much more than the dandelion children so they've got these super they've got kind of superpowers but you need this extra care. You probably need a bit more time alone. You want less toxicity in your environment, emotional and physiological. Um, so there's, there's plenty of research. I recommend um, Elaine Aaron's book, uh, actually. Also, Dr. Judith Orloff. Um, she, I think she used to be the Associate Professor of Psychiatry at UCLA. She's written plenty of books about sort of empaths and highly sensitive types, about guidance on how to look after yourself a little bit differently than maybe 
the other people who are even siblings because they're not highly sensitive types so so this is there's some of that plays into the resilience aspect so if you're a dandelion great and if you are you're an orchid then just know that you you know you're more of the ferrari type than a land rover and you just don't want to drive too much off off road mm -hmm. <laughs> um and you'll meet your sort of you know ideal and, and the last piece i'll just leave with this is you know resilience is um it's great and we can we can learn to sort of build more resilience really the self-compassion and self-love when you start to build that and you don't feel there's something inherently wrong with you then you you get more resilient to life you the knockbacks don't drown you you know the rejections you survive through them um but you know even when something big does happen and we're brought to our knees by it and it is just very traumatic and that's sometimes that's just part of life there's it can be an enormous source of growth. And so there's something called uh, post-traumatic growth, not the same as resilience. Resilience means something happens and you kind of just, it bounces off you. Most of us are going to have something that's going to bring us to our knees. What we want to then have, I mean, it's going to just challenge everything or just bring us to, I don't know how to deal with this. I'm on my knees. And what those kind of events tend to do is they can trigger post-traumatic growth where you will literally become a new person through it. So even if you do, you know, not have this resilience piece, maybe you weren't meant to. That's it. Part, sometimes we need to go through things that cause us a tremendous amount of growth personally, professionally, emotionally. And it's a crazy thing to say, but you'll have these people who'll say, you know, some of the worst things that happened to them are the best things that ever happened to them. And they wouldn't trade that in for the world. So, and this is, I'll leave people with them. Um, Matthew Sanford is an uh, amazing inspiration, the paraplegic yogi. So he teaches yoga and he had a terrible accident and, you know, became paraplegic. And it's, he talks about his journey in his book. And I recommend that to consider as well. So um, there's always hope always it's possible whether you've whether you're a highly sensitive type you just feel like the whole world is overwhelming or something's happened and it has brought you to your knees there's there's always hope so um yeah i would encourage people to look into matthew sanford's work it's and think about people like oprah winfrey as well you know terrible childhood raped by more than one person in childhood went through some really bad times and she's just another person who's inspirational reminder that we're not just victims you know, we may have experienced something, but we don't, we can, the idea is we can release that and we can overcome our wounds and we can become for, uh, whole again. So that's it. That's, that's all really excellent. Yeah. I think people are really going to feel how passionate you are about this through your voice. You can really tell um, how much this means to you. So that's why I wanted to have you on because I could feel that when I listened to the the previous interview that you did. So thank you for coming on, Nikki. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me and, and giving airtime to such an important topic. So thank you for all the work that you're doing as well. And where would you like people to find you online? Do you have a website and other, other places you'd like people to know about? Yep, yeah, they can come and uh, check out my website, which is nikigratrix.com. That's N-I-K-I-G-R-A-T-R-I-X.com. And I, yeah, I do one-to-one -one consultations. Actually, not for much longer because I'm launching an online course um, for optimizing energy. Mm. And I've actually got going to have modules in there that deal with the, the social trauma aspects and mindset and the whole thing. Um, and probably later in the year, also launching a podcast. So um, there is a free ebook you can get on my website called um, The Seven Steps of Healing at Childhood Emotional Trauma, which is completely free on the website if people want to stay in touch with my work. Fantastic. So for all the listeners, go to drhedberg.com and I'll have a transcript of our talk today. And if you want to check that out and also have links to everything that Nikki mentioned, so you can connect with her if you like. So take care, everyone. Thanks for tuning in and I will talk to you next time.